Hello everyone, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. Wishing you all an enjoyable listening experience. Today, the book we'll be discussing is, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. This is a classic read for combating depression, enduring for over three decades and selling over five million copies worldwide. Depression is often referred to as the common cold of the mind, afflicting individuals with feelings of low mood, hopelessness, self-doubt, and even suicidal thoughts. Surveys indicate that 1 billion people worldwide are affected by depression, and nearly everyone has experienced depressive emotions at some point. The book we're delving into today offers significant assistance in alleviating depression. Political studies have found that among depression sufferers who completed this book within four weeks, 70% no longer met the diagnostic criteria for depression. Their psychological and thought patterns also became more positive. According to a U.S. survey, out of over a hundred self-help books, this book is the one most recommended by mental health professionals. The author of this book, David D. Burns, is a medical doctor from Stanford University, a renowned psychologist, a contemporary representative of cognitive therapy, and a pioneer in non-pharmaceutical methods for treating depression. Cognitive therapy is a psychological treatment aimed at changing negative cognitions and thoughts. Compared to traditional medication and psychotherapy, cognitive therapy can more quickly alleviate depressive symptoms. This therapy also emphasizes that a self-help attitude is the key to recovery. Regardless of whether depression sufferers receive treatment, their willingness to help themselves increases the likelihood of recovery. In this book, Burns provides a comprehensive and effective self-help guide for individuals with depression and those troubled by depressive moods. It is beneficial for mild and moderate depression. However, the author reminds us that if moderate depression persists for more than two weeks, seeking professional help is necessary. Next, we will dissect this book into three sections. One, what is depression, and why do people become depressed? Two, how can one change their thinking to overcome depression? Three, how can depression be prevented through a healthy lifestyle? First, let's explore the first part, what is depression, and why do people become depressed? As mentioned earlier, when people are depressed, they often feel low in mood, hopeless, self-critical, and even pessimistic. When depressive feelings persist for more than three months, there is a risk of developing depression. From experience, people often fall into depression because they perceive a lack of something significant in their lives, such as love, money, friends, health, or recognition from others, and they feel powerless to change this situation. This sense of powerlessness is at the core of depression and is what leads to feelings of low mood, hopelessness, self-criticism, and more. These emotional experiences can be categorized into two core feelings, a sense of worthlessness and low self-esteem, and a sense of guilt. Worthlessness and low self-esteem manifest as a feeling of, I can't do it, and can be triggered by external criticism or negative self-evaluation. Individuals in this state tend to magnify errors and flaws, making them more susceptible to feelings of frustration, pessimism, and despair, all of which are characteristic of depression. For example, imagine Joker, a telemarketer who once had a call abruptly hung up by a potential customer. Joker feels deeply insulted, doubts his abilities, and believes he can't perform well in his job. This unwarranted self-doubt can lead to feelings of worthlessness and low self-esteem. Guilt, on the other hand, stems from the belief that one is inherently bad. When people do something they shouldn't have done or fail to do something they should, they might feel regret, but the belief that, I am bad, intensifies guilt and contributes to depressive emotions. For instance, John struggles to concentrate while studying for an exam, frequently getting distracted by social media and games. He fails to complete his study plan and feels a profound sense of guilt, thinking he doesn't deserve success and has let down his loved ones. This guilt can lead to depressive emotions. Under the influence of guilt and low self-esteem, people magnify the impact of negative events, lose motivation to change, and fall into a state of powerlessness, which triggers feelings of depression. In turn, depression reinforces feelings of guilt and low self-esteem, creating a vicious cycle. Research indicates that genetics and heredity account for only 16% of the factors contributing to depression. In other words, a significant portion of a person's sense of powerlessness in depression is influenced by their life circumstances and, more specifically, their cognitive thinking about those circumstances. Here, we need to introduce a key concept from the book, Thoughts Shape Emotions. For example, if you're walking down the street while looking at your phone and accidentally bump into someone, 
your initial reaction might be anger because you think they should have moved out of the way. However, when you look up and realize the person is blind, your anger might transform into guilt because you recognize that it was your fault for not paying attention. This illustrates how different thoughts and cognitive patterns about the same event can lead to different emotions, thoughts determine emotions. Objective and logical thinking generally leads to normal, healthy emotions, while irrational and distorted thinking can result in pathological and abnormal emotions. The author argues that the main source of depressive emotions, especially in depression, is cognitive distortion. Through years of research and clinical work, the author has identified that depression is often associated with 10 types of cognitive distortions. To make it easier to understand, these cognitive distortions can be divided into three major categories, absolutist thinking, overgeneralization, and personalization. Now, let's delve into each of them one by one. The first category of cognitive distortion is absolutist thinking. Its core characteristic is exaggerating the impact of an event, often turning it into a catastrophe. For example, a high-achieving student who performs poorly on one exam might think, my teacher and classmates will surely ridicule me. I'm utterly worthless. This absolutist thinking can lead to self-criticism and depression. Moving on to the second part, I will introduce three highly practical methods that can help shift your thinking and overcome depression. The first method is called the triple column technique, which is a powerful tool for challenging all cognitive distortions. The triple in this technique refers to a table you create on paper, with three columns, each corresponding to a specific step. Let's go through how this technique works with an example. Imagine Joker, who consistently holds himself to high standards as an outstanding employee. However, one day, due to working late into the night the previous evening, he oversleeps and misses an important meeting. Negative thoughts flood Joker's mind on his way to work, including thoughts like, I'm late, my colleagues will look down on me, I can't believe I'm late at a time like this, I'm useless, and, how could I be late? A month of hard work has gone to waste, among others. These fleeting thoughts all contain elements of cognitive distortion. In most cases, people don't pause to evaluate whether these thoughts are rational, they automatically treat them as facts and subsequently feel sadness and disappointment. The triple column technique can help individuals hit the pause button, re-examine the relationship between their thoughts and emotions, and free themselves from the grip of their emotions. The first step of the triple column technique is to jot down these negative thoughts that flash through your mind and enter them into the first column. It's essential to physically write down these thoughts rather than just thinking them through because putting pen to paper forces us to view things more objectively and enhances our capacity for rational thinking. The second step is to review the thoughts you've recorded and identify the types of cognitive distortions within them, then note these distortions in the second column. For instance, thoughts like, I'm late, my colleagues will look down on me, and, I can't believe I'm late at a time like this, I'm useless, fall into the category of overgeneralization. In these thoughts, Joker equates one instance of being late with his entire self, labeling himself as someone who is regularly late and assuming that his colleagues will disrespect him as a result. Meanwhile, thoughts like, how could I be late? A month of hard work has gone to waste, belong to the category of absolutist thinking, as they catastrophize the consequences of being late, resulting in self-blame, despair, and sadness. After identifying the types of cognitive distortions within your thoughts, the third step is self-defense. Here, you need to pinpoint the unsupported and illogical aspects of the cognitive distortions and replace the original negative thoughts with rational, evidence-based statements. Enter these new statements into the third column. For instance, going back to the thought, I'm late, my colleagues will look down on me, which belongs to the overgeneralization distortion, equating one instance of lateness with your entire self is irrational and absurd. So, you replace it with a supported, logical statement like, I worked late into the night yesterday, so being late today is understandable. My colleagues won't judge me for it. You record this new statement in the third column. Extensive clinical practice has shown that the simple act of writing down negative thoughts and engaging in rational defense can effectively change depressive emotions. In Joker's case, his cognitive distortions were primarily driven by self-doubt and self-deprecation. Reality often contradicts these beliefs, making it relatively easy to find evidence to counter them. However, in real life, many people may experience depression due to criticism, attacks, or even emotional abuse from others. 
In such situations, where the unfavorable conditions are genuine, challenging and mitigating criticism from others can be more challenging that at this point, we can use a technique known as verbal judo to respond. This is the second method we want to introduce. You might wonder, what does resolving criticism and attacks have to do with depression? The author believes that when faced with criticism, people have three options, the path of sadness, the path of anger, and the path of optimism. Most individuals with depression tend to choose the path of sadness, automatically assuming that the criticism is valid and then magnifying its importance under the influence of cognitive distortions. As a result, their emotions plummet, their self-esteem diminishes, and they sink deeper into depression. The path of anger involves responding to criticism with blame, engaging in counterattacks against the critic. While people using this path might initially feel a sense of satisfaction, in the long run, it can damage their relationships with others. Verbal judo can help us take the path of happiness. This approach not only helps individuals avoid sinking into depression but also maintains interpersonal relationships. Through eventually resolving issues, it can enhance self-esteem and emotions. It can be seen as a method of combating depression invisibly. The use of this technique can be broken down into three steps. The first step is empathy, which means refraining from jumping to conclusions or defending yourself when facing criticism. Instead, start by asking specific, detailed questions to understand the other person's true intentions. In the book, the author provides a dialogue segment demonstrating how to use empathy to respond to an angry critic, whom we'll call Stephen. The conversation goes like this. Stephen starts angrily, saying, you're a piece of useless crap. This statement is a full-blown verbal attack on the author. Instead of countering, the author asks Stephen, how am I like crap? This response doesn't deny Stephen's assessment but rather seeks to understand why Stephen is so angry. Stephen responds, everything you say and do is crap. You're cold-hearted and selfish, basically a worthless failure. From this response, we can see that Stephen's anger stems from perceiving the author's words and actions as cold-hearted and selfish. The author replies, let's go through this step by step. Please clarify, what did I say or do that made you think I'm heartless? On what basis do you think I'm selfish, and where exactly am I failing? In this dialogue, the author keeps clarifying and making the problem specific, avoiding denying Stephen's evaluation. This approach prevents Stephen from getting angrier due to rebuttal and allows him to focus on specific issues, eventually transforming adversarial communication into a cooperative relationship based on mutual respect. The second step of verbal judo is eliminating hostility. The principle here is to affirm any factors within the criticism that are based on facts, without arguing or mocking. Returning to the dialogue between Stephen and the author, after using empathy, the following conversation takes place. This time, Stephen shifts his criticism towards cognitive therapy, accusing it of being entirely useless. Of course, no therapy is perfect, and this aligns with the truth. The author acknowledges this part and responds, of course, there's room for improvement in many areas. Stephen perceives that the author accepts part of his viewpoint and refrains from further provocation, resorting to a personal attack by saying, you're a fool. The author still acknowledges the part that aligns with reality and replies, yes, many people are smarter than me. I'm definitely not the smartest person in the world. Stephen remains persistent and complains, you have no emotions for patients, your therapeutic methods are shallow, and they're all deceptive tricks. Once again, the author acknowledges the parts that correspond to reality and clarifies any misunderstandings. The response is, I can't always maintain a passionate and open attitude. I don't have control over that. Some of my methods may seem like tricks initially. Generally, people criticize and blame others when they feel that the person's words or actions do not align with their expectations. Therefore, by affirming their concerns, critics tend to calm down and become more open to sincere communication, laying the foundation for the third step, which is feedback and negotiation. At this stage, you firmly explain your position and feelings while exploring cognitive differences. If there's no right or wrong between the critic and the criticized, you need to flexibly present your thoughts, as was done in the earlier example about wearing a red dress to work. However, if you genuinely made a mistake, acknowledge it, thank the critic for their feedback, and apologize for any harm caused. Having covered verbal judo, let's now discuss the third method for overcoming depression, known as the reverse wine technique. 
This method is particularly effective in combating feelings of guilt. As mentioned earlier, personalization is a cognitive distortion at the root of guilt. When people face others' complaints and whining, this type of cognitive distortion is most easily activated. That's because these complaints and whining can make them involuntarily think, is this my fault? Should I be responsible for their miserable situation? The absurdity of personalization lies in ignoring others' autonomy. In most cases, individuals are responsible for their own actions. However, when people face others whining, they often fail to realize this, and that's where the reverse whine technique comes into play. The reverse whine technique consists of two major steps. First, it involves using the eliminate hostility method from verbal judo to affirm the winner in every way possible. Next, you need to find an angle to genuinely praise the winner. Remember not to offer specific advice. For example, if a mother complains to her daughter, during the divorce proceedings, your father sold all his shares in the company. I was the last to know. Did you know about this? The daughter can respond by saying, of course, I knew. Dad shouldn't have waited until the divorce to tell you, that was unfair to you. I agree with your perspective. The mother continues to complain, saying, but I don't know what to do now. We're out of money. How can I send your brother to college? She raises a problem, indicating her helplessness. The daughter says, that's a problem, we're out of money. In this dialogue, the daughter does not provide specific advice or assistance but acknowledges the existence of the problem. The mother connects this issue with the father and then complains, this is all your father's fault. He's lost his mind. The daughter still acknowledges the parts that correspond to reality and highlights her mother's financial competence, saying, he's not good with finances, you've always been better at it. The continuous acknowledgement and praise without specific advice, much like practicing Tai Chi, may leave you wondering how it can help the complainer. The explanation here is that people tend to vent or whine when they feel anxious and insecure. Offering them advice implies criticism of their previous coping methods. Therefore, they might continue to complain to supplement their new ideas and feelings, indicating that your advice may not be comprehensive or effective. Instead, if you can acknowledge and appreciate them, they will feel supported and eventually calm down. After the introduction in the previous two sections, we know that cognitive distortions are the root cause of depression. We've also learned about three methods to deal with depression, the three-step view, verbal judo, and the reverse wine technique. In the third section, we shift our focus from treatment to prevention, exploring what ordinary individuals can do to prevent depression and lead a healthy life. Preventing depression starts with examining implicit assumptions. Implicit means hidden, and people often believe that they are only valuable when they meet certain conditions or achieve specific goals. This personal value equation is known as an implicit assumption. For example, Jordan thinks, my performance, feelings, or behavior must be flawless, or else it equals failure. The implicit assumption here is, I must be perfect to have value. Positive and rational implicit assumptions can help us build a correct and reliable system of personal values, leading to self-improvement. Distorted and irrational implicit assumptions can create psychological vulnerabilities, and when these vulnerabilities are triggered, emotions can easily fluctuate, causing significant distress. For instance, consider two students, Richard and James, and their implicit assumptions. Richard believes, my value comes from my effort. On the other hand, James thinks, I'm valuable only when others praise me. Both of them face a failed exam. Richard quickly recovers and engages in new learning, but James becomes sad and can't pull himself out of it. Since James didn't receive praise due to the exam failure, he feels worthless and loses motivation. The author suggests that as long as people harbor distorted and irrational implicit assumptions, there is still a possibility of developing depression when facing challenges, even if they've been unnoticed for a period. Therefore, the key to preventing depression lies in identifying these distorted implicit assumptions and attempting to rewrite them. Here's an efficient method for finding implicit assumptions called the, the vertical arrow technique. It involves breaking down thought processes step by step. For instance, Susan is in a long-distance relationship with her boyfriend, and they agreed to talk on the phone every week. However, this week, her boyfriend didn't call her, leaving her feeling terrible and down. Will this feeling be temporary, or could it develop into depression? To answer these questions, we need to use the vertical arrow technique to uncover the implicit assumptions behind the emotions. 
Here's how it works, first, record the event and your thoughts, then continuously ask yourself, what if this thought is true? What does it mean? Keep asking until the implicit assumption surfaces. Susan, after writing down her thoughts, can begin the first round of questioning. What if my boyfriend didn't call me? What does that mean? Write down the answers, such as, he doesn't care about me, he doesn't love me. Then proceed to the second round of questioning, if this is true, what does it mean? Continue writing down the answers, like, I did something wrong, and he's being distant. Follow this with a third round of questioning, if it's true that I did something wrong, what does that mean? Susan's answer is, he might break up with me. Finally, the fourth round of questioning, if he breaks up with me, what would that mean? Susan's response is, it means I'm unlovable, destined to be alone, and will die miserable. This last answer encapsulates Susan's two implicit assumptions, if no one loves me, I have no value, and, if I live alone, life is meaningless. By using the vertical arrow technique to question her thoughts, Susan identifies her implicit assumptions. She understands that the reason she's so upset about her boyfriend not calling is that it triggers a crisis in her self-worth. Once you've found the implicit assumptions and the thought chains above them, you can use the three-step view, as introduced earlier, to examine the cognitive distortions within each thought chain and replace them with rational responses. For instance, in Susan's case, thinking that her boyfriend's distance is her fault is a cognitive distortion called personalization, and thinking that his not calling means he doesn't love her is an overgeneralization. In summary, implicit assumptions can lead to cognitive distortions, which, in turn, can result in negative emotions like depression. While changing implicit assumptions is more challenging, as they are deeply linked to a person's upbringing and family environment, awareness of these implicit assumptions can help individuals better cope with emotional distress and prevent depression. To conclude, this book primarily discusses the theory and methods of dealing with depression in three sections. First, it highlights that the core feelings in depression are a sense of worthlessness, low self-esteem, and guilt, with cognitive distortions being the root cause. Second, it delves into three methods to combat depression, the three-step view, verbal judo, and the reverse wine technique. Third, it emphasizes the importance of prevention and explains how to identify and modify implicit assumptions. It's important to note that these methods are aimed at mild depression and are not a replacement for professional psychological therapy or medication. If you frequently experience depression, please consider seeking help from mental health professionals. Congratulations on completing another book. Thank you for listening to the Tim Booker channel. Please subscribe to Tim Booker's channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you all, and goodbye.